Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second uh, day of the conference on AI engineering, software engineering for AI. We have yet another exciting day ahead of us uh, discussing different uh, aspects with papers, but also trying to insert some uh, interactions and discussions into our sessions. Without uh, further ado, I'd like to get the session started. So our uh, conversations this morning are around AI engineering practices, and we have five interesting papers. The first one is from our colleagues from CSIRO Data 6 from Australia, and uh, towards a roadmap for software engineering for responsible AI is the paper, and Tinghua will be presenting it. And as uh, we did yesterday, each presentation has 15 minutes. We'll do uh, quick questions, and then hopefully we will have some time for overall conversation with every attendee as well as the presenters. Tinwa, the yes. floor is yours. Can you share your slides? Thank you, Ipe. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, I will be presenting our roadmap paper on software engineering for responsible AI. And this paper, uh, we summarize the current state and also research challenges on this topic. So uh, first, I would like to introduce a definition. So in our work, we uh, use uh, Dignam's uh, definition. So it's uh, the development of intelligence system according to fundamental human principles and values. And there are many different versions of AI ethics principles. And in our project, uh, we use Australian's ICO four principles, which include uh, eight principles. So if you look at the list here, so some of the principles can be viewed as software qualities, and some of them can be uh, treated as functional uh, meta-level governance princi principles. And the motivation for uh, our uh, work. So uh, I think the main problem with the ethics principle is uh, they are very high level. So it's very hard for developers to use in practice. And there's a uh, like lack of concrete guidance for them. Um, if you um, think about the principles, one of the principles is human centered values, but uh, the principle itself doesn't tell how human values can be uh, design or implemented in the development. Uh, also, the existing work, they are mainly focused on algorithm uh, level solutions, for example, using uh, math mathematical analysis for privacy or fairness. But ethical issues, they can actually happen at any step of the life cycle and uh, can be cross-cutting different components of the AI system. So uh, in our paper, we claim to build a responsible AI, we need to have a system level solution uh, and it should be end-to-end, -end, so it requires further applied software engineering research. So that's the motivation for our paper. So to identify the roadmap, we uh, did a systematic literature review, and we defined two research questions. Uh, the first one is what principle is uh, addressed by this study? The second one is what um, solutions is uh, proposed by this study? So uh, this figure shows the structure of the roadmap. So it includes three layers. The first layer is uh, about governance. So it includes uh, multi-level governance mechanisms. And third layer, uh, the second layer is a uh, process uh, perspective. Uh, so we summarize a set of best practice uh, developers can use uh, in their uh, projects. And uh, the third layer is a uh, system uh, system level solution. So we try to build responsible AI by design um, architecture style uh, through design principles and patterns. And also we identify some system level techniques. And in our work, we not only focus on uh, trustworthiness of AI system, we also try to improve human trust in AI systems. So this uh, figure shows the governance mechanism, mechanisms we found for uh, different levels. Uh, for example, for industry level, the developers uh, could follow building code, which is a type of regulation uh, regulations. And uh, uh, because regulation, they usually take time to enact. So uh, some government they adopt regulatory sandbox, 
for example, for autonomous vehicles to, to be on road uh, without changing the national law. And here we also list uh, AI maturity model uh, to assess the AI capability of an organization. So the assessment result can be also used uh, to certify an organization's uh, AI capability. And for organization level, um, the organization management people, they can uh, have uh, design code of ethics for their employees to follow. And in some papers, they discuss about uh, leadership commitment. So we can add a responsible AI statement in the company's values, vision, or mission. And many organizations, uh, they uh, have their own risk assessment framework. So uh, we can also consider to extend the existing risk assessment framework to cover uh, responsible AI aspect. And the team level governance is mainly about how to manage uh, the development process. So there are already uh, some documentation templates in the community, like uh, model card or uh, data, uh, data, set for, uh, data sheets for data set. So developers could consider to uh, prepare uh, documentation using this template continuously in their projects. So in terms of challenges, uh, we list uh, some challenges here. So uh, we claim we should establish multi-level governance framework for responsible AI, and the mechanisms should be linked with different stakeholders and the, the uh, relevant life cycle stages. And also responsible AI challenge is not only about software engineering, so it also requires um, expertise uh, from other commun community like machine learning uh, community or uh, human AI interaction or social science. So uh, communication is needed in between uh, software engineering people and also the other communities. And in addition to uh, organization level training, uh, we think education for students is also needed like for different levels of uh, education. Um, and we found some papers talking about how to use an ethical uh, robot as a use case to educate students. And the education can be K-12 um, or for university students. Uh, the course can be a, a, like a separate uh, AI ethics course or can be a component in the AI uh, courses. And here uh, we summarize all the practices we found through, uh, from the papers. So, um, under, for example, under requirement engineering, we could use ethical user stories to collect uh, ethical uh, requirements. And we need to make sure the requirements uh, is verifiable and measurable. And this should be also traceable both backward to the state, uh, relevant stakeholders, also forward to the uh, design modules or code pieces. And on the design, we, uh, for example, summarize uh, some ways to reduce ethical risk. Um, the first one is to reduce frequency of occurrence. So we can think about change the uh, change from the decision mode to suggestion mode. And for uh, the second one is about reducing consequence size. Uh, we can have like a deployment uh, patterns, for example, only deploy um, the new version of models to, uh, to one uh, region of users uh, to reduce the uh, consequence size. And uh, we can also uh, consider consequence response to, re to reduce the response. We can have like fallback or override the decisions um, to deal with, uh, to reduce the ethical risk. And for implementation, uh, I want to mention, uh, we have some work like building up the uh, knowledge graph based on some regulations. So we can use it to uh, automatically uh, check whether the API design is ethical or not. And for ver verification and validation, um, there could be different types of tests, uh, including ethical acceptance tests. And some papers uh, mention we should track the testing history, and there could be uh, uh, ethical problems with test cases. So it also requires uh, ethical assessment. And on the operation, um, because AI system is uh, con need continual learning, so um, but the current uh, practice is just like one of type of risk assessment. Uh, so we think uh, it requires uh, dynamic and also extensible uh, risk assessment for different contexts, like different cultural, different application domains. So for the process pr perspective, we uh, the first challenge we identified is uh, we need to integrate software development process with AI model pipeline. And we need new 
uh, requirement engineering uh, method to capture AI ethics principles. So for business analysts, uh, sometimes they only uh, they are like more familiar with functional requirements. So we can think about a new method or tools for uh, to like generate uh, ethical uh, or ethics relevant uh, requirements. And for design stage, uh, we should consider both trustworthiness and trust. So they are uh, actually two different concepts, but often mixed in practice. Uh, we can like have design patterns or process patterns uh, to improve trustworthiness. But for trust, we need to consider to offer some evidence uh, to the users of AI system. And the last one is about uh, monitoring and validation. So usually in a paper we see uh, it's about like validation of output of AI system. Uh, but for AI system, we also need to uh, consider or look at the outcome. So whether their uh, intended benefit can be achieved by the system or whether the behavior uh, is proper in some given uh, situation. And here shows the design patterns we found uh, in the uh, literature review. So uh, the design patterns could be considered as product component or product features. Um, and here we use a state diagram to show when the design patterns could take effect. For example, we have a bill of material. So we can, we can consider to adopt this design pattern to track supply chain information, like who is the supplier of the AI component or which version is this component, uh, and also dependability uh, relationship with other components. And uh, we can also attach ethical credential to AI systems or AI components. Uh, on the other hand, we can also request to verify the ethical credential of the users of AI system to see if they, are, they have the ability uh, to drive the uh, autonomous vehicles or to operate the drones. And one um, pattern for decision making state is AI mode switcher. So it's about like um, activating or uh, turning off the AI component at the runtime. Uh, so kill switch is uh, one example. Um, and we also uh, list multi-model decision maker here. So we can like deploy different models to perform uh, the same task uh, for the system. And uh, for um, homogeneous redundancy, it has a similar idea. So we can have like redundant uh, device uh, components, including AI component or non-AI component and cross check the results. And the uh, incentive registry could be, uh, it's uh, like, about recording the incentives rewarded for IC core behavior of the system. And that ca there can be different uh, levels of co-versioning uh, to ensure the data of model provenance, like co-versioning of uh, data model code configuration or co-versioning of AI uh, component or non-AI component. So for the federated learning one, we can uh, uh, like manage the co-versioning of uh, local models and global models. And uh, for the auditing state, we uh, list ethical black box to record the critical uh, data and the runtime. And if sometimes if an uh, ac accident happens, it could involve like multiple AI systems. So global view auditor can be used to like collect data from different AI systems. Uh, so we can like uh, cross the data and identify the liability. And this pattern can be also used to like, re re uh, improve reliability. For example, for the vehicle, they can use the perception data from the other uh, vehicle to make decisions. And we extended the uh, traditional template. So in addition to context um, and uh, problem solution consequences, we also uh, include type of approach. So which means whether it's a process pattern or a governance pattern or design pattern. And we also have type of objective, uh, whether this pattern to, is to uh, improve trustworthiness or trust. And um, the pattern template also covers who are the target users, who are the impacted stakeholders, uh, which stages uh, are covered by this pattern, uh, by this pattern, and which uh, principle is relevant to this pattern. And uh, we also uh, summarize a set of techniques. So uh, these techniques can um, be like many of them can be also considered as components uh, or design patterns uh, in the system design. And for challenges, um, 
because we need to combine AI components and non-AI components, um, and this combination uh, may create new uh, behavior. So uh, we need to define responsible AI by design architectural style through principles and patterns. And some ethical requirements um, are like conflict, uh, conflicting with each other. So like the principle, privacy principle, or transparency principle, um, but the current practice is you really just follow one principle, but um, override the other one. So we can also uh, think about using these patterns. So next step, uh, we are currently uh, working on a uh, pattern catalog. So as the operationalized guideline for different stakeholders. Uh, so in addition to design patterns, we also uh, like uh, have confidence patterns and uh, uh, process patterns. And we are also working on a great literature review uh, to cover a more com complete uh, state of practice. That's all for our uh, work. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kinkua. Uh, any questions from the audience? I do have one question. As I was listening to your talk, as well as reading this paper, as well as some of the other papers that came from your uh, team, the first thing that comes to my mind is, well, these principles are responsible, uh, not only applicable to AI, but it's applicable to any system development. And I don't see the discussion of data as dominant because when it comes to AI, you might have all the good patterns and practices, but if your data is poisoned, you may not be able to deliver responsible results. So what were your findings uh, related to the data aspects of developing AI systems? Uh, I think it's a very good uh, question. So in our paper, maybe I didn't this, um, like explain it in, in the presentation, but we did uh, I think identify the difference between AI system and uh, the traditional software. For example, for uh, requirements, uh, we, we think ethical requirements might be more for AI systems uh, rather than uh, software systems. Also for uh, operation, um, we like I said in the presentation, so we uh, emphasize not only output, but also outcome um, because AI has, like, is a high stake technology and it has high risk. Uh, so um, that's why we believe responsible AI solution uh, is needed to help uh, AI provider uh, to unlock the market and also improve their uh, product com um, competitiveness. Um, so I, th I think that's that's our uh, that's our findings through the research and also project. Um, in terms of data, I think maybe most relevant uh, work pattern is is a co uh, coercioning one. So I guess most of the pa uh, patterns. I currently uh, found is more about uh, transparency or accountability. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's yeah. my thought. yeah. Yeah, the co-versioning one. I see how that might apply because of the way how data evolves and how your model maps to the data and whatnot. That, that's a good observation. Well, thank you. I encourage all the uh, audience uh, and participants to definitely read all the papers. And without further ado, we'll go to the next, uh, our next presenter who's already setting up. And that is uh, AI governance in the system development lifecycle insights on responsible machine learning engineering. And Samuel Lato from University of Turku is our presenter. Uh, yeah. All righty. Can you hear me? Yes. And the. Uh, can you see the Gorgeous. slides as well? Yes. Yep. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so we're a bit late, so I, I try not to drag this on too much. So uh, let's get going. Um, here's a typical software development team. And here's a data scientist. And now we're in a situation where the data scientists ha are increasingly work uh, working with the rest of the software development team in order to create more complex systems. And they're following typically one of or, or, or several, several SDLC, so system development lifecycle models. Uh, here are four of them. One of them is Scrum, so not exactly an SDLC model, but a way of doing. Um, and they're creating this complex system like self-driving cars or, or, or then uh, security critical systems or uh, such as uh, mo money and payment systems. And, and there's really a need now to uh, govern this system. So artificial 
intelligence and, and, and machine learning systems in particular have, have changed, uh, shifted from uh, this purely academic endeavor to, to become a part of everyday systems. Uh, so when we talk about AI governance, we mean how to govern AI. Here's one definition uh, from our team. So AI, I'll read it out loud. So AI governance is the system of rules, practices, processes, and capabilities used to ensure that an organization's use of AI technologies aligns with the organization's strategies, objectives, and values, fulfills legal requirements, and aligns with principles of ethical AI followed by the organization. All right, so how do we bring this AI governance as part of the system development lifecycle? Here's, this is, this is the question we wanted to answer in, in this work. Uh, so our research question, uh, what AI governance related issues and decisions are involved in machine learning development projects during their entire life cycle? Uh, how to approach this? So we chose the interview approach. We wanted to find people who had uh, experiences of these kind of systems, uh, either in supervising them, uh, creating them, uh, programming them, or, or then uh, from the academic perspective, if they have academic knowledge on, on best practices and so on. So we really uh, emphasized diversity of opinions. So uh, we had a, a very simple criteria. We wanted to find experts in either machine learning systems, SDLCs, or both, who had at least five years of experience with this. So in 2021, early, we suggested names, um, contacted our professional networks uh, to, to recruit participants. And in the end, we got 17 names. Uh, here they are uh, in no particular order, I think. So a heavy focus on the industry, but we had some professors from the academia and a few uh, data scientists as well. Uh, interview process. So we took these four archetypical SDLC models, and then we kind of kind of ask ask questions also related to a governance from each of these models. Um, also, uh, we wanted to get an understanding how the uh, informants conceptualize AI governance in, in their previous work, what issues arise, and how these issues relate to the entire life cycle of the pro uh, products that they were creating. A data analysis. So we used the GeoIA method and had three main steps. So first, familiarization with the interview material. So we had a professional transcribing service do the transcriptions, which was really, really nice. Didn't have to do it uh, uh, ourselves. Uh, so, and then we, we just kind of made notes uh, and, and tried to understand what, what was said and really get into the data. Then we did some open coding. Uh, and wanted to identify all uh, AI governance aspects from the data. So all unique instances where AI governance was mentioned, we wrote them down, tried to uh, classify them, what, what they were about. And then in the end, we formed a thematic framework to describe the data. So here we used the three, uh, the three key steps of any software product. So design, uh, development, and operation. Uh, so in the end, we found like 20 AI governance con uh, concepts, which are listed here. I'll not go to, uh, to these in detail yet, later on soon. So then we uh, mapped, mapped them uh, to second order themes. So kind of kind of what uh, higher order category they belong to and connected them to these three steps, design, development, and operation. Uh, so let's go through them. Uh, uh, and, and beginning with the design phase. So uh, when defining a business case for any product, we need to assess the suitability of using machine learning in the first place and AI governance, things related to that. Also project level needs. Um, regarding the data sources, we have to check what, what data we have available, what capabilities we have for collecting new data that could be used to train our models. Uh, do we have a capability to use the data we have? So are there, for example, some ethical or regulatory uh, barriers to using the data? Um, then the external environment, so the surrounding IT e ecosystem, are there some limitations to governance coming from there? Uh, the technical tools, dependencies, uh, any governance there? And then regulatory compliance, of course. Um, then moving on to the development stage, so regarding data, uh, 
data versioning um, uh, is, is very important in order to have the audit trail. So if something goes wrong, what ver a data set was used to train the model? We need to understand that. Also validate the data. Uh, in the previous presentation, there was a question about model poisoning. So that's really, or data po poisoning. So that's a really thing, something to consider. So how to validate, govern the data is really what we think it is. Um, model versioning, also important for the audit trails. There are, of course, solutions also that automatically already uh, keep track of this if there are some algorithmic specific things like what what uh, how, what kind of a model architecture did we have and so on parameters and that kind of thing all, all these all have to be documented for AI governance uh, then the testing phase we we found or discussed about manual overview or uh, in in addition to all the automatic tests that we have we have to manually check that everything looks good so there are some of that uh, then of uh, machine learning models are often tested with a test data set uh, so uh, all the data things related to the test data sets and governance of those uh, it's important and and then the operation environment so where is the model actually in production what kind of system is there what kind of governance things are related to that and then Finally, the system operation, the third part. So we already discussed this system testing thing, but it's related to both. So now let's go to the model explanation. So here, uh, interpreting the model, model interpretation, and XAI, so um, how can we, or how should we explain the model, how it works? Um, the customers may have some needs to understand the model. Uh, if there are, for example, medical professionals using an ML system to predict something, they need to maybe understand a bit about that. So XAI, explainable AI is very relevant in, uh, in that. And then there's automated monitoring. So bias detection, anomaly detection, anything that unusual about the system when, when in operation. Uh, and when we take these three steps, design, development, operation, uh, we, we can kind of create this waterfall, sequential model. Uh, what are the things we need to take care of? But of course, modern software development very rarely follows anything like this. Instead, it's, it's a pipeline, typically like a CI, CD thing, uh, where we begin with, uh, with a design, then we have a development loop, uh, integration build, deployed build. Then we go to the operation part where we have the automated tests, quality monitoring, development to production, continuous feedback, and then we go go forward from there. So in this uh, heavily automated environment, how can we map all these governance aspects there? So now we, in this uh, figure in below, we have bolded uh, the design development and operation stages. And, and, and we believe that the governance aspects we identified should be somehow mapped to these, but, but that's like a research to practice this uh, question. So how do we bring this research into practice? So in conclusion, uh, we identified 20 AI governance concepts or issues that were mapped onto three stages of the SDLC, design development and operation. Three concepts can also be viewed as part of a CI CD pipeline and research to business activities are needed uh, from here onwards to uh, to have these complete solutions. There are already companies in this business like uh, Credo or Sidot uh, who are who are in the business of creating these AI governance tools uh, that, that can be used as part of an MLOps or, or similar pipeline. So that's it for the presentation. Um, reach out to us or ask questions if we have time. I don't know if we have time. I think we have because I rushed quite a bit. <laughs> Thank there you. There is time for maybe one clarification question. Uh, I, I'll, I'll ask one, uh, Samali. Uh, so who is doing the governing? And I think depending on the who is doing the governing, uh, some of the practices might change. Is it like uh, envisioning an automated governance or an external party who is interested in the governance? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So the stakeholders, um, there, that this is actually not a straightforward thing to answer, I think, mm -hmm. uh, because, because the, for example, from regulation, we have different roles um, and, and, and it, a lot of the responsibility comes from there. But typically, it, it's, it boils down to who is the company who creates the system and, and, the, and the regulations surrounding the company. And if they sell the system onward as a service, uh, they are primarily responsible for it. There may be some outside regulatory bodies that kind of 
have some requirements. For example, I live in Finland and here we have the EU regulation. There was recently an EU AI Act released and if this AI Act goes through, then we have to abide by that in everything we do. Um, there's always the GDPR here as well. Yeah. So, so, so I think there are multiple stakeholders. Maybe uh, yeah. during the discussion time, we can come back to this because uh, unlike the other systems that do not have AI elements and components, the governance, the criteria is more dominant, both from different perspectives, which change both the automated tools, the software development and system development lifecycle, as well as the stakeholders that needed to be interacted with. But without further ado, we'll turn to our third presenter and hopefully we'll have time to come back to this conversation. So our uh, third paper uh, is uh, from nowhere but Chalmers and the Goldilocks uh, framework towards selecting the optimal approach to uh, conducting AI projects. It's a collaborative work between, uh, I think, three different uh, entities and Rima is our presenter. And I did not even attempt your last name, but would you please uh, pronounce it for us? <laughs> yeah. Um, good day to everyone. My name is uh, Rima, Rima Jusupova, and I'm going to present uh, our paper with regards to selecting the optimal approach, how to conduct AI project within engineering company. Um, uh, I'm myself uh, um, uh, working at McDormand as a department head for electrical instrumentation uh, di discipline and uh, as well a uh, uh, PhD candidate at Anhorn University. This paper was written together with Jan Bosch, professor from Chalmers University of Technology, and Helena Holmstrom Olson, professor from Malmo University. Um, basically, what um, our research was based on the real-life use cases which were uh, conducted within McDermott. McDermott is a large engineering corporation and it executes, executes projects all over the world. And the projects like, uh, for example, petrochemical plants or, um, let's say, offshore substation from the wind, uh, for the wind parks. So usually the scale of the project is starting from half billion and, and beyond. And um, data which we used for our use for the use cases has been collected all over the globe from um, uh, offices in Americas, in the Middle East, in uh, Asia Pacific, and also Europe. Um, the use cases which we considered is basically AI projects which has been uh, executed, um, let's say, that the, um, by AI uh, team uh, of, of, of McDermott. Uh, they are related to first engineering our uh, budget prediction tool. So basically, uh, in these projects, uh, we collected data from um, executed uh, engineering projects during the last 10 to 12 years. And then based on this archived data, building the prediction tool for their uh, next project, how much uh, engineering hours it will be used and how much cost uh, it uh, will be involved. The second use case, uh, it's uh, defect recognition of engineering on the engineering drone itself. Basically, what AI model is doing is finding the mistakes in the engineering design, which usually uh, has been done uh, through manual check. And the third case, which has been considered, is digitalization of PDF drawings. What happens is that sometimes companies like McDonald or any other engineering contractors, they receive PDF drawings, uh, they received the engineering drawings in the PDF format or even sometimes scanned format. Yeah, and um, uh, engineers, they have to redraw all this uh, complex blueprint in the AutoCAD or Avivo or any other uh, software. So uh, basically, the purpose of this case was how to reduce this manual work. And then um, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, for each, um, yes, the, um, the 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 reason why company conducted this project at first uh, at, at first place is um, because they tried to find how to automate repetitive work, and the most important to free up very costly engineering hours or engineering uh, resources. To, to focus more on the um, uh, engineering design rather than uh, do manual repetitive task. And uh, uh, also, of course, to develop tailor-made solution for the, for the industry itself, uh, for, the, for, uh, for, uh, for the company. Um, 
So all these cases has been performed using different approach. Some of them like use case one where we uh, did the um, a prediction on the uh, engineering budget. It has been developed in house. Uh, the case two where uh, we find the engineering mistakes on the complex blueprint, it has been developed and in-house and also with collaboration with the AI platform uh, solution provider. And then we compared the results. And uh, the third case where we use, uh, uh, we use AI service uh, company who actually digitalized the engineering drawings straight into AutoCAD or any other software. So that's uh, that service has uh, is available on the market. So we decided to go straight for the ready to use solution. Um, to analyze, uh, um, basically to analyze our empirical results, uh, we use uh, the structure uh, adopted from MLOps and uh, we considered each phase of the project execution and compare it, compare different approach. Uh, if we, if I go um, uh, to the what kind of the research questions we put for ourselves, it's basically we uh, we wanted to find out okay what are the key factors that the company need to consider before even starting AI projects, and uh, also how they will affect on the long term strategy, and uh, that's and uh, that was our main question uh, as a company who is conducting these projects. And also because there was not so much, um, let's say, reference in the literature and also from uh, within the industry. So we decided that's actually the gap which needs to be filled in. And at the end, we um, derived the framework which can be used as a helper tool to other practitioners. Um, so if uh, I jump straight to the um, our results, basically here you see the factor that the key factors which we identify as a must of things before conduct uh, any AI projects. I will not go through all of them. I will only focus on the less obvious ones. And then less obvious, which at least based on our experience was intellectual property. For example, uh, when uh, for the use case too, when we use the deep learning model for object recognition to find the, the mistakes in the blueprints, um, first, we develop, um, if you develop model yourself, okay, then the model belongs to the company. There is no, 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 no discussion. However, if you use the model which are available on AI platform and you cooperate with this company, then the question, who is going to own the model after it's trained for the specific data? And this was very important for us as a McDermott to have the ownership and not all the companies I agree to provide this ownership to us, not all the AI platform uh, providers. So that's the first question you need to be think about. The next uh, less obvious uh, things is how to scale up, because once you make a proof of concept, regardless whether it will be um, in-house development or in partnership with someone else, then um, you need to scale up on the at least on the company. Um, uh, within within the company, and if the company is huge co uh, corporation, you need um, infrastructure. Uh, you need to host the model. You need to have user interface, and for the end users, and also for admin people who are going to retrain the model or um, also update the model. And it's not a trivial task to build a user interface for deep learning models, which can be uh, intuit intuitive. For, for end users. So that's that was also our big learning. And here, we decide, uh, based on our experience, we realized that going for the collaboration is the best approach because they already have ready solutions. And even if we um, develop our own model, it's better to host it on the third parties. Of course, um, uh, making sure that all the uh, uh, factors like cybersecurity and uh, yeah, that's 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 uh, that's covered, and it's also cheaper because uh, uh, to build uh, this infrastructure within the company, it's quite costly. Uh, IT departments still need to be adjusted to serve AI, um, let's say AI uh, products, yeah, AI models. 
And uh, also another important factor, uh, which I would like to focus on, is legal constraints. At the beginning, it's not always obvious whether you are, as a company, even able to share any data with third parties. And um, for example, at McDormand, because we are an engineering company, and uh, our engineering drawings, in fact, contains a lot of intellectual property of other clients or other technology provider. So it's not clear whether you can share it with anyone else or not, even, um, let's say, to, um, to, to improve the quality or improve the, the schedule of the, of the project execution. So uh, it is important to involve the legal department at first stage. So they have to make sure that we are not bridging any contracts with our clients. And that factor is, was also not that much obvious from the beginning, and it affects a lot how to proceed uh, with um, AI projects. We must do it in-house or we can outsource. For example, the first case when we uh, collecting the data um, from executed projects to make a prediction tool, it was impossible to go for outside uh, outside um, uh, third, third party because the data is too sensitive. So it was decided to whatever cost is, we will develop it in house. So therefore, um, uh, of course, uh, the, when when uh, when you look at the end, your uh, company um, always need to decide what is the most what is the priority quality, cost, or schedule. And we try to um, structure it per phase, per workflow phase. Uh, so to make sure that that's, um, let's say, um, this tool can help also other practitioners. And uh, uh, let's say, when, when we entering every phase of the workflow, it's it could be different, uh, different options could be applied. Yeah? For example, if we talk about business understanding and that understanding phases, it must be in-house, yeah, because it's very important to understand first um, what are the business need, not uh, not vice. Um, let's say you need to understand the business uh, need and then to realize what will be the business gain if we use AI solution. And sometimes um, also um, it's important to understand whether AI actually can help. It was. Also mentioned, I think, in presentation before, like uh, whether AI able to help particular to this business need, yes, uh, yes or not. Then it's important to understand the requirements from the legal, and important to understand what kind of data needs to be used. So when that's done, then data preparation and model development can be outsourced. And here we specify what would be the best approach based on the quality, cost, and schedule. What is the priority? And deployment, as I already mentioned, it's uh, uh, based on our experience, is cheapest, easiest, and high quality if you if we just use already existing infrastructure. Um, so collaboration with the platform solution provider is one of the best way. So as a conclusion, we presented this framework, which can be used as an assistant tool. And also, of course, we understand that um, this study needs to, uh, to be replicated in other engineering companies because although McDermott is a quite large company, in fact, it's a lot of companies within one company. Um, however, it's still um, one, one McDermott. But the, the problem is here that there is not so much um, reference exists um, of implementing AI into engineering companies. Um, experience still need to be built, lessons learned still need to be gathered, and uh, most of the engineer companies, they started developing AI internally, but most of the time it's, it's just a small cluster within a big corporation. Proof of concept um, is there, but not really a references uh, how, uh, how successful project is, whether they meet all the requirements and uh, uh, whether, whether the goals are achieved. So it's quite difficult to estimate the initial investments. And that was the reason why we would like to share our findings with the industry and also with academia, just to um, basically um, make a first step um, to, to create this common knowledge. Um, well, I think that's all from me.
Thank you very much. You know, very interesting uh, observations and consistent with I think all of us who are working with different companies of different sizes. We have one question from uh, Jane. Uh, let me read it. Uh, well, maybe Jane is coming uh, online. Some of the questions you posed seem to be at the organizational level and others at the project level. Did you consider these two levels and which decisions are reusable across projects within the organization? Um, well, uh, basically, of, yeah, uh, the, on, on the organization level, of course, you, you need to consider when we're talking about the business understanding. So what is the business need? For example, if you see the um, nice AI solution available on the market, you are not going to think, okay, let's let's apply it. Maybe we will get something out of there. No, first you need to find the, where are the gaps in your particular business and then looking for solutions uh, which can be which can solve it. Uh, but it's uh, further with project execution. Of course, we go for, um, um, we start, um, let's say certain aspects if you don't have experience you never thought before like for example uh, legal constraints we only realize it when we start collecting the data and then we're oh that's 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 something we have to involve legal department with and the same with the uh, um let's say with ip for example because when we start choosing the company for partnering then we uh, start discussion. Okay, are you going to share this IP with us? Are you going to give the the the, uh, um, the ownership of the model which we are going to retrain, or you are going to use uh, McDonald or our company to improve your solution for others? Yeah, and uh, so that's that type of um, decisions came during the project execution, and of course, it's always need to be discussed with the product management because of, uh, at certain moment. All the stakeholders need to be need, uh, need need to be involved. I'm not sure if I answered the question, but <laughs> yeah. we'll definitely come back to this. I think uh, there are a number of things that uh, might. Uh, but Jane, uh, do you want to follow up or? No, no, that's fine. Thank you. Right. So uh, thanks a lot, uh, Rima, and uh, let's move on to our next paper uh, to give them the uh, time as well, uh, which is. Uh, what is an AI engineer and empirical analysis of job ads in the Netherlands? And uh, Marcel uh, Meesters will be our presenter. And may I please ask everybody who is not part of the paper and not presenting to go off camera? What is? Mm. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ipek. Uh, yeah, so I'll uh, present our research uh, about what's an AI engineer. It, it's cooperation between uh, Fondus University and Eindhoven University of Technology, both located in Eindhoven, in the south of the Netherlands. Uh, Alexander is a full processor uh, in software engineering. Uh, Peter Heck, he is sitting beside me uh, during this presentation. Uh, she is senior researcher, uh, lecturer, and also uh, wrote numerous papers on uh, AI. And I'm um, a researcher as well, a lecturer, um, and also involved in quite a number of AI projects. So to put some context there, so we see, uh, we heard that already, there is quite um, an increasing demand for AI engineers. It's uh, increasing, uh, let's say, by the year. And um, when we uh, were working on curricula to develop our curricula we found out there's not too much research is done on what exactly is now being expected from uh, ai engineers in uh, in the field in the job market uh, so that was a starting point for our research uh, to find out what are these characteristics uh, uh, of uh, an ai engineer in uh, in the field uh, we think this is relevant and uh, not only for curricula development uh, uh, in various universities uh, but of course also for students to know uh, where to focus on and also for companies to get a better understanding uh, uh, what is really that field of AI engineers uh, what uh, do these uh, these functions do uh, to start there of course we had to think about uh, the definition of AI engineering um, if you look to the picture below in this uh, slide uh, um, there were many 
definitions, but not really, let's say, one, uh, let's say, generally accepted definition, but most of them had something like uh, it's a combination of a data science, AI, machine learning uh, discipline at one side and software engineering at the other, combining this and then uh, to uh, to develop, um, yeah, as it's called, uh, within AI enabled uh, systems or production ready machine learning systems, uh, as we put it in uh, our paper as a working definition. So starting from uh, from this definition, um, yeah, we wanted to, uh, to understand the characters I just said, and then mainly we focused on uh, what are then the job tasks uh, executed by uh, these AI engineers. Uh, that was our first research question. The second one was uh, related to, let's say, these two disciplines that uh, combines together AI engineering. So does uh, the, the, the function and the role of AI engineer stem more from a data science perspective, a software engineering perspective? Is it both? Uh, is there a certain focus? That was uh, was another research question. Uh, then another one was, uh, was related to uh, uh, what technologies are being used. Uh, I put it between brackets here because uh, I will not uh, not cover it here in this presentation, but you can find uh, details uh, in the paper and also in quite uh, many other uh, technology reports uh, like from uh, uh, from LinkedIn or Indeed. And then the, the last part that we focused on was uh, the soft skills uh, of the AI engineer. Then our approach, yeah, um, we choose to uh, to use job ads as our source of uh, of data for uh, for getting our our data from uh, job ads. Uh, it's used uh, in in more research uh, uh, projects, and it is let's say uh, widely available. It also covers let's say quite a wide uh, uh, field of companies, institutes, uh, etc um easy accessible and already gives quite a good um understanding of uh, what is expected from uh, ai engineers from these various companies so when we made this choice uh, we thought hey we can use uh, uh, let's say databases like from indeed or linkedin uh, but when further digging into it we found out that uh, they do not allow it for the research purposes uh, that uh, that we intended to do even after some communication with these companies, uh, they didn't allow us uh, to use uh, their, let's say, database with uh, job ad information. But luckily, within Fontes, we had um, a subscription on job feed from the company TextKernel, uh, who offers on a monthly basis, uh, let's say, the data from, uh, from, uh, from all the vacancies that are available in the Netherlands. So we could, uh, we could use that. And then the next, uh, let's say, step in our selection process was, uh, yeah, from this huge set of uh, of um, job ads, which one to uh, to use? And for that purpose, uh, we used, uh, let's say, uh, an approach similar to the process um, uh, used with uh, uh, systematic literature reviews. An important step there is uh, uh, inclusion exclusion. What do we include uh, and what not? Uh, for inclusion, we uh, we used uh, two factors: uh, the the time frame uh, and also, let's say, the AI engineer. What uh, what to include and what not, uh, given that function. The time frame: uh, we took the period, uh, let's say, the last three years uh, from the starting point onwards uh, uh, with our research. So that was from April 2018 till uh, April 2021. And uh, from the perspective of what and in which uh, of these uh, job ads to include, uh, we used uh, the, uh, the the job uh, the job ads that uh, included something about AI uh, engineer, uh, ML engineer, deep learning engineer, and let's say all variations, um, uh, both uh, let's say acronyms, uh, full written out Dutch, English, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And so we, we looked then at the full uh, job ad text and not only at, uh, at the job titles. Um, so that gave us, uh, let's say, a selection of, um, of, uh, of, of 
let's say a raw selection and then we further really read into these uh, these job ads manually and then we made uh, a further selection given our definition as i just explained it uh, for ai engineering and then we ended up with uh, 367 uh, job ads that fitted all the criteria uh, the next step was coding classifying um, so we used uh, uh, we first did the manual coding and then afterwards we did uh, some uh, a card sorting uh, method to uh, to classify and to categorize uh, all the various aspects as i already mentioned uh, job task technologies and, uh, and soft skills so that was let's say our method the way uh, we uh, we addressed it and then come up to the results uh, one of the first interesting results that uh, what we saw is that there's quite a uh, big uh, variety in uh, job titles uh, uh, that uh, these job ads uh, are, uh, are given. Uh, so, of course, uh, what we could have expected, uh, uh, ML, AI engineer, that was uh, on top of the list. And uh, let's say a large part uh, were uh, contained that expression in the, in the job title, sometimes even a bit uh, further elaborated. Uh, so, for example, uh, ML engineer for uh, in healthcare business or something like that. Uh, then we focused on, let's say, these uh, these main um, phrases. What's also interesting there is what you see also uh, data scientist or software engineer uh, also came up as job titles for uh, what we uh, uh, what we defined as an AI engineer. And so you can say that surprisingly, because it looks like to focus only on one uh, aspect of, let's say, the combination of data science and uh, software engineering. Uh, but if you look deeper into these job ads, uh, we found both um, th that, uh, let's say, uh, they covered both aspects, but not so much in the title, but further down in, uh, in the job text. Uh, also, deep learning, you see, uh, as a, I would say, a subcategory of machine learning. Uh, uh, we found a number of these job titles. And you see quite a long list of, uh, let's say, more limited occurrences of, uh, of job titles. Then another interesting finding was uh, related uh, to, to the job task. Uh, when we categorized uh, them, uh, we found five main categories. Uh, uh, Four of them we also see back in, for example, ML uh, uh, Ops uh, from Farah, or also uh, the AI engineering lifecycle as uh, presented by, uh, by Jan Bos, uh, for example. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so let's say from data to machine learning, uh, developing uh, uh, and training uh, models towards development, software development, creating applications, and in the end, uh, going into production, monitoring, uh, etc. Uh, but the interesting thing is that we also found, let's say, this fifth phase, uh, which we call business understanding, uh, which really is about, uh, let's say, uh, understanding the business, uh, gathering requirements, sometimes also exploring opportunities uh, that AI can uh, can deliver uh, for let, by using uh, AI uh, uh, engineering. Um, and of course, as I said, we didn't find that in uh, in the reference I just mentioned. But for example, in uh, in CRISP uh, data mining uh, methods, uh, this is also explicitly mentioned. So where we propose also, if you look to MLOps or uh, AI engineering uh, lifecycle, to also add uh, this uh, uh, this step uh, in the lifecycle. Then the other uh, interesting uh, finding was about uh, where really does this AI engineering job at? Where do they stem from or where is the focus? Is it more related towards data science or software engineering? And what we found is that uh, you can categorize them in, uh, in, in a few categories. Uh, some of them were really focused on data science, uh, uh, ML uh, engineers, uh, but made, let's say, also uh, Let's say they, they, they require tasks uh, more related towards software engineering, uh, sometimes working together with software engineering or actually uh, developing software uh, themselves. Or the other way around, it was, let's say, focused on software engineers. And then uh, uh, there was a requirement that they also have an understanding on machine learning, AI, incorporating models uh, into, uh, into their applications uh, and then further uh, bringing uh, them 
into uh, production. And then there was a third category, uh, which uh, in fact uh, were required to focus uh, really on both. Eh? So they really asked uh, both from a data science machine learning perspective uh, to have knowledge and experience and from software engineering perspective. In fact, we saw two subcategories there as well, some more really on the general level, uh, but some also were really uh, required expert level on both these, uh, these disciplines. Then going to uh, a next uh, uh, finding uh, that we looked at, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we also looked at the soft skills uh, for an AI engineer, which came out of this job ad. Uh, so after categorizing, uh, we came to the list, or at least uh, the top 10, as you see here. Um, and we uh, compared that to, let's say, other research done on software engineers, also requirement engineers, uh, what is found there uh, related to uh, to soft skills. And what we saw, it was quite comparable. Eh? So most of that uh, we could map. Uh, sometimes the wording was a little bit different, but we could uh, quite see uh, it uh, comparable, except for the one in purple here, open to learn or willingness to learn. It scored uh, uh, quite high in, uh, in our research of AI engineers where it scored more at the lower side. Uh, for example, if, if we looked at uh, the research for Maturo or uh, also uh, uh, for, uh, for requirements engineers. And when considering this, uh, we could think of uh, AI engineering as quite innovative, uh, quite, uh, let's say, uh, fast uh, pacing technology. And so from that perspective, um, yeah, it is really an important requirement. Uh, for AI engineers uh, to not only know the, let's say, the status and the technology of today, but also being uh, able to learn the new technology uh, which will pop up uh, in the coming years. Uh, so learning to learn uh, is an important skill as well as, uh, as we consider uh, this uh, finding. Then going to the end of the presentation, um, we had, I would say, three main conclusions. One, uh, AI engineering uh, life cycle, we propose to add the business understanding step uh, as a first step in this, uh, this cycle. Uh, two, uh, we see uh, that, that there are, let's say, uh, engineers which are more uh, focusing on data science with, let's say, uh, having knowledge about software engineering and the other way around software engineers with data science knowledge and also, let's say, more the generalist uh, kind of, uh, of role. And I think that's important also if we look to uh, for education institutes, to curricular development, uh, that both, uh, uh, let's say, edu education uh, um, should, let's say, focus uh, on uh, on both. If, if it starts from data science, add software engineering. If it starts with software engineering, add also data science in, uh, in the program. And the third one, um, also important for, I would say, students, uh, people to, to really know that um, it isn't over after university, but uh, I would say it's lifelong learning uh, if you are uh, an AI engineer and education institutes can focus on that uh, to also, let's say, help students in uh, learning to learn. That's my presentation. I see I'm also at the end of time, so probably not too much time now for discussion, hopefully later, and otherwise also via Twitter. You see our Twitter handles uh, below as well. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for uh, interesting data and presentation. We are, I think, one after another have a lot of good things to discuss. So in the interest of time, let's have our last uh, paper presented and then I'll invite all the uh, presenters and we'll have the discussions and we'll definitely get to those two questions. Without further ado, uh, our last, uh, next and last presentation, Anmol Singhal from T CS uh, Research will be presenting their paper on Data is about detailed and empirical investigation for software systems with NLP at core. And Mo? Thank you, Ipek. Yeah. Just let me share my screen. Sure. I hope it's visible. Yes, it is. All right, great. So hello, everyone. Today, I and Mo, I'm here to present my work titled Data is about detail and empirical investigation this work has been done by my team, including me, Preetu, Pratik, and Smita. So as you all are aware, artificial intelligence 
smart machines automation anymore they have become an increasingly important aspect of all enterprise solutions who are trying to build solutions for their clients all software products are integrating ai in some fashion or the other and to build such solutions with ai at core one needs to collect and process humongous amounts of data which has made the role of data integral in the software development life cycle it can also be said that data is one of the most valued domains in the tech sector today so this uh, shift towards data requirements has imposed several new challenges and requirements that need to be addressed so in this paper through an based on interviews with practitioners we present current need to be addressed in this data requirements of software systems with nl now you but you are wondering why focusing on only nlp at this point so nlp is one of as you are aware it's one of the key components of ai centric systems and not just that the synergy of software engineering with natural language processing is immense a lot of data pertinent to software engineering is actually text data such as requirements business rules contracts on so in this work our aim was to answer the following research questions we first try to understand what are the key data related challenges that practitioners are facing while dealing with nlp problems what are the impacts of these challenges on overall projects and what are the effective techniques that are currently being used by practitioners to address some of so to conduct an empirical study we recruited practitioners who had several years of experience in working on artificial intelligence and especially software projects with nlp at core our participants had the following common characteristics all of them had worked for large multinational it companies but they had worked on ai projects from customers all across the globe they had worked in the area of ai for at least 4 years and had experience in working with nlp core projects for two or more years and everyone had experimented with multiple ai technologies and had applied ai technologies to multiple domains we approached uh, several people through emails out of which 10 practitioners agreed to be a part of our study we used semi structured interviews to conduct our empirical study in which we asked open ended questions to our participants the interview questionnaire that we used was finalized after rounds of discussion with senior researchers who were experienced who had the experience of conducting empirical studies we also conducted pilot interviews to assess the applicability of our questionnaire to um, various uh, interview participants and then the finally then finally the interviews were conducted using video conferencing and the interview transcripts were auto generated for interview transcript analysis we used the guidelines of hoda's grounded theory method we first read each transcript individually and tried to understand various concepts that we were trying to arrive from uh, the data that was there in front of us and then after rounds of discussion we arrived at a consensus regarding the high level categories that were there in the data these high level categories that we identified were representative of different data related challenges and their impacts it was further observed from our uh, analysis that a lot of these challenges are related to each other in terms of the stage in which they typically occur so to talk about these stages the first of them is data collection stage which is the basic stage and we are trying to list problem objectives and trying to obtain sources which fulfill those objectives when it comes to data requirements the next stage was the data in which we try to get some structure to the data before we feed it as input to the ai model and finally the data annotation stage which is critical for a lot of supervised learning projects in which we need access to a lot of labeled data for training so to talk about challenges of the data collection stage in a little detail these include unavailability representativeness class imbalance complexity of the model incorrectness and societal bias i'll talk about each of these uh, these challenges briefly unavailability of data as you can imagine deals with the unavailability of credible sources from which data can be extracted and this problem is more pertinent 
for industrial and enterprise level projects which need large amounts of data for building you know collection of this data can be extremely time intensive and can even incur a lot of costs there have been some solutions that have been proposed in literature such as uh, training paradigms like transfer learning meta learning being used these days to address some of these challenges similarly complexity of the business model can also pose huge challenges when it comes to data collection uh, in some models there can be hierarchical classification the classification may be very fine grained and things like that which again incur a lot of costs we need to divide the overall problem objective uh, several times into smaller goals and using and you know using hybrid approaches and things like that can be potential solutions to this Class of talents, as you order, there is another important challenge when it, it's it's a very common challenge that is faced in classification problems. Different solutions used to tackle this challenge effectively, including usage of some statistical and sampling techniques. Not handling this challenge effectively. Models. Societal bias is one of the key challenges that researchers nowadays are, are trying to address when it comes to the data collection phase of the project. we want our models to be trustworthy and fair to all sections of the society in case there is some bias that is present in our models it can lead to discrimination against certain sections on the basis of gender caste religion and so on which could be uh, which could hamper uh, the uh, model objectives in the real world to resolve this challenge uh, researchers are increasingly doing things attributes dropping samples which could indicate discrimination and so on representativeness is another important quality that we always try to maintain in data in case our data is not generalizable enough it could lead to performance loss we want our data to be collected from different domains and we should also have awareness of different metadata attributes when we collect data these metadata attributes could be things like geography and time which could uh, bring some attention to the generalizability aspect then we come to the challenges that are data processing stage this these could include challenges like confidentiality and compliance requirements which are essential for industries these days there can be other challenges like data extraction lexical syntactic errors and spe specialized language which could also pose solutions to our overall project life cycle confidentiality is increasingly becoming very important in enterprises as a lot of critical documents are this uh, can you know uh, lead to a lot of delays as a lot of level of clearances are required to maintain confidentiality at all levels to mitigate or to minimize these delays as far as possible it is advisable to get these clearances as early in the project life cycle as one can so that unnecessary delays can be avoided in the later stages of the project also strict adherence to confidentiality guidelines posed by enterprises is always a good practice compliance uh, requirements can be similar and it is very important that one involves appropriate legal competence early into the project to address such challenges data extraction from unstructured sources is also a huge challenge when it comes to ssnlp core projects because a lot of data that is being collected is from pdfs which come from different geographies different time zones and including uh, you know there can be web pages which have no they can contain a lot of they can contain lots of unnecessary text elements can and can also have different formatting styles conversion of this data into a structured format can be very expensive in terms of cost and time some resolution strategies can be to have a dedicated pre processing pipeline in place breaking bigger challenges into smaller tasks and executing them one after the other so as to minimize the challenges faced in this stage specialized language comes uh, is, is very important especially for projects that involve legal text because it can contain a lot of convoluted terminology which can become difficult for models to interpret there are uh, sentence simplification models being used these days to make the sentences a little comprehensible and uh, so that uh, the models can effectively execute the nlp life cycle lexical and syntactic errors are also very prone when it comes to text data and presence
thing and then even after source of ambiguity in text so presentation strategies are to involve usage of nlp tools and libraries that are publicly available these days to address some of these challenges finally i'm going to talk about the data annotation stage in which unavailability of labeled data can be apart from that credibility and subjectivity are also important concerns unavailability of labeled data can uh, is a major challenge and can be addressed using you know some uh, data programming tools and automating the process of data annotation it's not well and this is something that even christopher talked about in his keynote address yesterday lack of credibility can also be a huge challenge when it comes to data annotation it is always advisable to get these annotations verified from subject matter experts sampling a subset of these annotations and sending them to smes is a good idea also a good practice is to have a well defined set of annotation guidelines and conduct surveys to ensure uh, the credibility of annotations subjectivity is also related and can arise when a lot of labels that we assign are not clearly defined and human annotators are left to make a subjective choice this could introduce annotator bias into the model and can even lead to loss of performance some resolution strategies could be again to have annotation guidelines in place and clearly defining the labels that we are assigning to each sample of our data set some identify our study was that uh, if you look at the challenges that i just discussed and the data collection and data these are universal in nature and could occur in all ai centric projects that one need with similarly industry specific challenges like confidentiality are also not unique to text data and can occur in project that we have talked about so far some although there are some other challenges in the data processing stage such as data extraction issues complexity of text presence of lexical syntactic errors which are specific to ss nlp core projects there can be situations where there can be hidden challenges in data hidden vulnerabilities which are not easy for uh, a human to or, or practitioners to even identify these hidden shortcomings can manifest in later stages and become huge challenges especially when the models are being deployed it is advisable to address these challenges as early as possible in the project some threats to validity of our problem can be simply included to ensure credibility of participants responses and ensure that the responses that the participants give are generalizable as far as possible also we wanted to avoid uh, introduction of any bias from our side into the analysis that we do to ensure this we we only considered volunteers for our study and uh, we ensured that we give them uh, the freedom and the independence to talk about their experiences uh, by dealing with such projects we also ensured that we have participants experience of working on so that general ability of these findings can be maintained to avoid introduction of our own personal and discussion each other and also adopt guidelines uh, from our in of uh, our can help mitigate it them extent and also a data first approach to development is essential why we just not you know talk about model but same time our future work would focus on expanding some of the mitigation strategies uh, that are currently being utilized for some of these and we would also like to build a data plugin which is capable of making data specific recommendations to who are working on these kinds of ss and lpco projects thank you and uh, thank you very much anmol and thanks uh, to all the uh, presenters uh, for uh, really insightful uh, work that uh, they presented at this point i would like to welcome all presenters uh, and uh, we have a number of questions so uh, let's maybe start with the last one 
Um, well, there's a question for you coming from uh, Luis, uh, who asks, were there any insights on examples of regulations that pose the worrying challenges? Well, yes, that's and all. I the question. Am I? Yes, you are audible, but kind of breaking in and out, so. So maybe if you go off camera okay. and uh, we'll come back to the question. Can, can you try again? Yeah, um, is it better oh, now? Okay, now it's better. Yes, it's better now. Yeah, all right, great. So uh, yes, that's. I think that's a very important question. And we uh, discussed this with our interviewers who were, uh, we discussed this uh, some of, the participants of uh, different interviews uh, had important insights about it. And uh, some regulations that, uh, you know, specifically when I talked about uh, data processing challenges, such as compliance re requirements and, uh, and confidentiality requirements. So, of course, there are, uh, you know, GDPR uh, related issues and other compliance related issues, some local laws that could okay. that is when we are dealing with uh, deployment of such solutions in uh, you know the real world, where such dish, uh, such challenges may arise specifically for enterprises, and uh, there can be also issues when uh, you know such data is uh, such work is actually being published in forums like this, because a lot of times uh, these confidential confidential data cannot be made available in the public domain, and there are a lot of there are a lot of disclaimers that are associated with data sets. So although these are uh, some necessary evils which need to be ensured, but as I mentioned in my presentation, there are ways to minimize the delays that can arise because of ensuring such regulations and such compliance requirements. And they can be to incorporate such uh, requirements early into the project as far as possible. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Samuli, I invite you as well. Uh, I think this is a good time to have the uh, overall conversation and discussion, but I want to make sure that we don't miss the questions that were posed to Marcel and uh, Petra on the what is an AI engineer work. So let's start with Eva's. Have you found uh, any overlappings uh, between the skills of data engineers and AI engineers in your work? Marcel and Petra, that was, I think, directed to you. Shall I answer? That's I, think, fine. I think I can more or less answer both questions in the same time. Um, sure. because, uh, what we didn't show, maybe Marcel can uh, can show it now in the slides. What we didn't show in our presentation is that we um, we we first uh, uh, queried the job ad database for just uh, query terms like AI or machine learning or engineering or the Dutch term for it, uh, ontwikkelaar. Um, and then uh, that returned a set of more than 700 job ads. And for those 700, we went through them manually to see if it's actually an AI engineer or a different type of function that was returned. Um, and for example, uh, uh, for example, we had also project manager, manager uh, functions returned that did mention terms like engineering and AI, but actually, yeah, they were the, the, the job role was for somebody managing projects. And that was not what we are looking for. We were looking for actual people uh, building uh, software systems with an AI component. Um, okay, Marcel has a bit of trouble. Okay, yeah. Um, and here you see, for example, that uh, uh, in our initial query, we got uh, around 40 uh, job, uh, role, job uh, ads for data engineers. But when we looked into the job ad text, we saw, okay, this is not uh, an AI engineer, but somehow they were mentioning AI or machine learning in the job ad text. Um, and the other way around, if we look at the job ads that we included, uh, maybe you can show the previous slide. Uh, there's also about 23 uh, job ads that had the job title of data engineer, which are AI engineers. So yeah, it, and it was also something uh, we discussed about it a lot to see, okay, is this a data engineer or an AI engineer, uh, which is called data engineer? So it's it's still not we are not um we try to do it uh, we discussed both of us and also with alexander to see okay to come to a kind of consensus 
uh, but it's still uh, something that we see uh, we, we focus more on software engineering uh, and and data science but data engineering is also something uh, yeah we couldn't look more into as a separate discipline actually that we see uh, coming into into the field uh, so data engineer ai engineer software engineer and the, then yeah. this ai engineer is still somewhere in the middle between data engineering and software engineering so yeah so i think there are quite a number of very interesting conversations here those of you who might know or have read his work uh, dear philip Kruften, every time we use uh, uh, the word engineer he would remind us in some countries the designation of engineer is a very involved process with some uh, qualifications and you need to pass exams and you can't just throw that word around it comes with responsibility i think when it comes to all these that was the first thing that i thought uh, reading your paper any qualifier that it's i think liberally used ml engineer learning engineer and lp engineer data engineer but we don't necessarily maybe do uh, diligence in terms of what it means to engineer these kinds of systems so uh let me make sure that uh, we address uh, the questions. I think there's a good question that is coming from Andre. Unfortunately, we don't have the first speaker, but maybe Samuli, you could take this as first. The question is from Andre, and it reads uh, a question for the first two speakers, but mostly to all. Uh, model explainability was mentioned several times in this session. In practice, it often turns out that ML model explainability methods are hard to explain to non-experts to start with. Have you ever experienced this challenge? Any practical tips? So Samuli, you had the governance, yeah. so you might uh, address it from a governance perspective, but I think everybody might have insights and we can tell a uh, door around around. So go ahead, why don't you get started? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I posted a, a link to the chat. We recently did a literature review on this. Um, and I think I, my knowledge mostly comes from doing that literature review. But certainly there are various kinds of uh, tips and tools and tricks how, how you can better explain um, explain AI systems to non-technical end users. Uh, it's true they have some, some trouble uh, quite often, in fact, uh, but we did, a, we did a kind of, a, a, I don't know, a synthesized framework how to do it. Uh, so there were there were for example the following tips so consider trade-offs between explanations and ensure visibility so don't uh, uh, show explanations of ai systems all the time but allow participants to choose when to see explanations consider using metaphors provide sources for the data used to train the models visualize personalize support the user's thinking um, increase their curiosity uh, towards the system and how it works. Uh, pro provide a general rather than case-based explanations, link explanations to users' existing mental models. Uh, consider the potential misconceptions they may have. Uh, these are all from, from that study. So, um, I mean, it's, it's a very complex topic and, and worthy of uh, studying more. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other insights, or we could go to the next question. Uh, Anmol, you have another uh, question uh, from Louis. Uh, did you collect any impressions on what kind of automation engineering is being used to address the data challenges you identify, such as confidentiality, understanding the data? Yes. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, for different challenges that we identified, there were different techniques and solutions that were uh, being used to address each of them. So just to give you a sense of some of the automation and engineering techniques that are being used um, in the data collection phase, when we face challenges such as unavailability and even complexity of the model, there are uh, techniques being used such as, uh, you know, different learning paradigms like transfer learning, meta learning, which are emerging these days uh, to deal with to carry out uh, you know uh, uh, ml uh, solutions with as le which uh, the least amount of data that is possible and uh, especially in terms of complexity there are other knowledge engineering, engineering techniques collect uh, building of knowledge banks and uh, so on techniques that are being proposed to address some of those challenges so, and uh, as i talked about uh, data Again, automating anno data annotation tools, data programming, such as tools like Snorkel and all those 
um, other uh, tools that are being developed so uh, in these days are also some of the techniques that are being used uh, for each challenge the, uh, of course uh, one needs to tackle that particular challenge separately so there is not one straight answer to this question but yeah i mean uh, there is being there is a lot of work that is being done to address some of these challenges mm -hmm. thank you very much so we are almost out of time and uh, please do stick around for the rest of the day as well. We're going to be talking about all of these uh, throughout the sessions, but in particular during the interactive session that we've designed. My last question is going to be to Rima to close the uh, session out, although we still have questions coming in. Rima, does uh, McDormand employ AI engineers? Um, yeah, it's, and how do they employ them? How do they select them? Yeah, it's a really good question because now we are in the front of the decision: shall we establish the AI department, yes or not? And when we uh, develop, let's say, um, uh, develop those use cases, we try to find the talents within the company. So if some people knows also AI and knows programming, and we found them, um, yeah, because the company.